Today on the Mr. Maple Podcast, Tim and Matt count down the top 25 lace leaf Japanese maples for your garden. Hey guys, welcome to the Mr. Maple Show. I'm Matt. And I'm Tim. Today we got a great podcast for you. We're bringing you a top list. We know you all love those. Uh, again, make sure you find us on your favorite podcast platform. We are on all the major platforms now. Go check us out. We've got a lot of podcasts behind us now. So you can go through and listen to great interviews, some other top lists, like top 25 lists, top 50 lists. And so we've also got some good gardening advice here on our podcast. So check out our full podcast We've got a lot of cool ones. Yeah, they're anywhere major podcasts are found. And you can also find us on YouTube. We air these at 8 p.m. Eastern in the video format. So you can hop in there and be part of that live chat. And definitely check out the Mr. Maple Show on YouTube. We add new content every single day there. Guys, today we've got a great list for you. I think it's going to be a fun one. Uh, Tim and I got in here and hashed it out. We did some debates over lunch. We, uh, we argued. We fought it out. Today we're bringing you our top 25 lace leaves. Now, these are all Acer Palmatum dissectum, so we have disqualified some of the Japonicum and Shirasawatum lace leaves for, uh, you know, for uh, clarity there. These are our favorite uh, top 25 Acer Palmatum dissectums. These are uh, lace leaves. Some might be weeping, some might not be. All different colors. We tried to get different categories involved here, so there are a few of them that kind of represent a category sometimes, but I think you're going to like this. It's going to be one uh, that, I, you know, might spark a little bit of debate amongst our viewers even. But I think you're going to want to stick around for this one. Uh, MrMaple.com's Top 25 Lace Leaf Japanese Maples. If you know nothing about us here at Mr. Maple, we're a mail-order nursery. We specialize in Japanese maples. We do over a 1,000 different selections, a 1,000 different cultivars of Japanese maples, and we mail-order them directly to your door. So if you like what you're hearing, remember to shop on MrMaple.com. All right, guys. This is an easy topic to get involved in. Uh, you know, Let us know if you're watching that live chat. You can just put a little hands up if you have these. It's a fun thing to get involved in those live chats. We have a lot of discussion going on there. But uh, if you're listening on the audio platform, you can always look any of the pictures of these up on MrMaple.com too. We have a Mr. Maple Files section. It's a great reference for Japanese maples. And I tell people this all the way, but definitely get involved in this. Uh, we give away a book every single week here on MrMaple.com worth of information for free about Japanese maples. So let's get right into it, guys. We've got our top 25 lace leaf Japanese maples uh, you, you may agree with us. You may not, but these are the right answers. <laughs> <laughs> so Matt and I really did. We made a list of our favorite lace leaf Japanese maples. We sat around and argued out which ones we wanted to put in for each selection. And we tried to create little different categories as we were going along. There were only a few pun punches thrown, uh, but, but we've, we've got to the right answers here. And if you disagree, you're probably just wrong. I mean, you know, Charles Barkley said, I may be wrong, but I doubt it. That was the name of his book. <laughs> uh, no, it, these are just some of our favorites. And, uh, you know, I could probably change this weekly. You know, the truth of that is my favorite Japanese maple beat might be the one I'm looking at this week. Uh, but these are, you know, pretty definitive list of some of the top lace leaves. Uh, I think you're going to enjoy this one. If you stick around through number one, there may be some shockers in there. But uh, it, it's a fun list and an interesting list. Now, the thing I love about this is that there's a diversity in these lace leaves. Right. There's so many variations, even when it comes to Acer Palmatum Dissectum, mm. that you can find things that are really unique and really different. And there's some that are similar to some of the ones that we're talking about today right. that didn't make the list simply because the it's, it's cousin, it's the one right. that looks similar to it, made it on the list. And we do probably a couple hundred different varieties of lace leaves here at our nursery. I mean, we do... If we really get technical, probably 1,400 different varieties of Japanese maples, maybe more. Uh, you know, we keep saying we're going to get that list done, but we're always too busy. But we're going to get our total list out at some point, so you have every single cultivar here at Mr. Maple. Uh, but let's get into it. At number 25, we have Midori no Teboku. Yeah, Midori no Teboku, also known as V. Corbin. Uh, this is an introduction found by Dr. Corbin, introduced by Talon Buckholtz. The thing I like about this, one of the main things I like about this is the way this thing has long, elongated lobes, mm -hmm. but the sublobes are more narrow. 
Great fall color. I mean, normally very golden yellow to orange in the fall color. This tree is a crisp green in the summer as well. And it really just adds a lot for a lace leaf there in the landscape. You know, smaller overall habit with a lot of arching. So this one's going to get a little wider than it does tall. A lot of these lace leaves that we're talking about are going to be more in that, you know, cascading umbrella style shape. This one's a little flatter than some of the others. So it is low and wide. Um, it's done pretty good for sun tolerance. You know, that one is going to be uh, zones five through nine. You're definitely going to want some late day shade in that zone nine, probably some morning shade even in zone nine on that one. But it has done pretty well, I would say, in sun in most zone eight environments. Now, if you're up close looking at this plant, like I talked about, you can really distinguish the leaf really stand out from many of the other lace leaves. One of the ones that didn't make it on the list would be something like Washinoo, also known as Palmetifolium or Palmetophidium or Eagle Claw. Um, those, it didn't, that cultivar didn't make it onto the list because it was very similar to Midori right. no Tiboku when it came to the actual leaf structure. Now, the thing about this plant that's really unusual, too, Matt talked about, mm -hmm. is the name means green and spreading, and it has mm -hmm. a lot of that horizontal branching. So this is, is one that is very unique because it does stay very low and very wide. And that's one of the reasons it was selected, and that really up close how the, the actual foliage is different is just an extra bonus on top of that. Oh, classic tree. I mean, I think a lot of people probably forget its talent introduction. Um, you know, we, we listed as three feet tall by seven feet wide, just for perspective. Uh, you know, even in a 10 year period, that's a pretty wide tree for the height. So as a lot of these are going to be more umbrella shaped, this one is low and mounding. So next up we've got Emerald Lace and that number 24 Emerald Lace. Emerald Lace, I love this plant. And an interesting thing that when you get extra geeky about it, this one may not really be uh, a Matsa Murray, like many of the other lace leaves, it actually has the small seeds and similar foliage as Seru, which is an Acer palmatum, subspecies palmatum, mm -hmm. variety dissectum, which is really unusual and really different, where many of the other lace leaves are Matsa Murray's. Uh, that explains its vigor, and it's extremely heat tolerant as well. Uh, again, another one that is much wider than tall. This one's going to put on more width. It's quite vigorous. Uh, it, it really puts on a good bit of growth. It's not uncommon for this one to get much wider than tall. What really attracts me to this one are the color changes. This one's going to leaf out in the spring, a really nice chartreuse green going to more of an emeraldy color as it fades. So as this one, especially in shade, it gets more of an emeraldy blue color. Uh, it may have some relationship with Seru. We're not sure. Maybe a broom off Seru. The two certainly have similar vigor, similar leaf shape and similar fall color. And that's really one of the things that makes Emerald Lace really unique. It is a, a green that goes to a very bright, bold red in the fall. And for that reason, it's very unique. I mean, most of your greens are going to go to more of a yellow or orange in the fall. Uh, there's only a few like Green Hornet, which I think, you know, was a, a runner up for the same one, the same spot here. Um, Autumn Fire was a close competitor right, right. as well. Great green lace leaves that go to more of a redder fall color. And that's kind of cool because you get the best of both worlds. I mean, with Emerald Lace, if you want a red lace leaf, it's going to have that ever fall. You're going to get that emeraldy green interest. But then, you know, when you hit fall, you're still getting a red lace leaf in the yard. So it's going to look starkly different than it did in the springtime. The reason for me, emerald lace won this category of really having some good red fall color like that is because it is so heat tolerant. Mm -hmm. I mean, this plant can handle a lot more sun like Seru does than many of the other lace leaves, even in those hotter climates in the South. Mm -hmm. um, I know that... When we talk to people down in Alabama, this is one of their favorites because it is, has that extra heat tolerance to it. And it was found by David Sable, like Matt mentioned, we believe it has some relationship to Sayuri, whether it was a seedling, a weeping broom. We don't really know exactly what this relation to is, but it's the only other lace leaf that we've seen that is that palmatum subspecies palmatum rather than the subspecies Matsa Murray. Yeah, extremely vigorous, guys. It's not uncommon for this one to put on more than a foot of growth a year. Now, again, most of that's going to be in width, not in height. Uh, we list this one as three to four feet tall by six to eight feet wide in 10 years. So you're getting a good, vigorous lace leaf. It's one that's going to go out. You know, it's going to fill out pretty quickly. It's going to look like something uh, It relatively a short amount of time. Uh, a larger tree makes it a great candidate for a container garden because you can get that wide spreading habit going on on top of a planter. A uh, beautiful tree to be growing. But, you know, really unique, too, for, for the growth rate, for the shape of the tree. Uh, another one that's not going to be quite your typical umbrella. It's going to be a little bit more of a, a long plateau within a weeping habit. So it's a little bit wider. And uh, definitely give this one a little bit of space. It, you know, it does, it does get some width to it. 
So coming in at number 23, we've got another Talon Buckles introduction. Yeah, number 23 is Shu Shidari. Now, this is a great one for color changes as well. Um, probably a lot of you probably might not be as familiar with this one as some of the others on the list. Um, it, I, I would say it's probably an underrated Talon Buckholz introduction. Yeah, the name means orange and weeping, and it's a good small to mid-sized weeping Japanese maple that really has a unique color to it. Mm -hmm. You get some emerald greens in it. Um, in the springtime, it's more of a red. You get some emerald greens coming into it with almost like a bronze orange tipping to it. Mm -hmm. And then during the summer, it can go a little more green with some more of those tipping. And then in the fall, you really can get some nice oranges to bright reds. Yeah, this one's going to be more of your standard umbrella shape. It's typically four foot tall by five to six foot wide in 10 years, making it more of your standard, you know, lace leaf umbrella dome going on there. Awesome tree. Uh, it's had good heat tolerance for us. This one's done well up in, in sun up to zone eight. Uh, you know, definitely those zone nine people are going to need to give this one a little bit more protection than most of your typical heat index zone nines. Yeah, this is one of the plants we have a decent size one of these mm -hmm. at our gardens at Maplewood Gardens. And this is one that I've always thought we need to get in production more and more and more. And this year we've actually been able to offer a fair number of Shushidaris because we really made this a priority. It is such a unique and underused lace leaf Japanese maple. It really has a nice fall color too. I mean, I would describe the fall color as more of an orange red, typically. I mean, it has some really nice shades in there. It's a very picked up bright kind of orangey red and uh, just really showy overall. I mean, it's one uh, I think is a Japanese maple collector. It makes a great pairing for some of your more common lace leaves that you may know. Uh, it's going to give you some color diversity there and kind of widen out the group of what lace leaf Japanese maples can do. So you can see where you're thinking similar to things because I guess the closest thing to it would be number... 22, which is Dr. Brown. Yeah, Dr. Brown, the uh, the best Japanese maple with the worst name. And people don't think of Japanese maples and brown as being a good color pattern, but it's funny because a lot of the Japanese books describe the color patterns as brown. Uh, this one named after a doctor, obviously named Dr. Brown. Uh, probably doesn't do the tree any favors, though. People are like, brown? You know, I, I can think of a million better names for this plant than <laughs> Dr. Brown. Uh, but amazing colors. I mean, this one gets out a soft pinkish color, that is really unique, and it kind of really accentuates that maroon characteristic in early spring. Uh, I see a lot of websites steal Talon Buckholz photo of this one and post it for other trees because it can get a really electric orange-red, really orangey fall color uh, that's really nice. So if you're looking for a really true orange fall color, I think Dr. Brown's one of the best for that. The worst problem about those people who use this photo is they use it on Orangeola. Right. They don't use it for the right they, tree. They don't even use it for the right tree. So they're using Talon, someone else's photo on the wrong tree. Right. And that just irks me a little bit. I even <laughs> contacted them and said, hey, you need to fix this. And they never made, they never fixed their mistake. It's a common thing. It's, you see it a lot, actually, where people take that photo and and use it for Orangeola. And uh, it, it is orange in the fall, but it's not orangeola. Dr. Brown really stands on its own two feet. I should say standard. Uh, but this one's going to be more of a four by five, making it another of those mid-size for lace leaves. I mean, really most of our lace leaves that we're talking about, unless we clarify otherwise, are going to be more dwarf or Japanese maples that people think of with that low cascading umbrella. And Shushidari fits that really well. It's more your standard lace leaf style shape. It's, it tends to have a very full canopy to it. It tends to be a canopy that unless you prune it and open it up, you're not seeing into it. It's a very dense canopy. I remember when Mike Francis Sr. spoke to the Maple Society about what's in the name. And like you mentioned, Dr. Right. Brown's it's got the, the wor it's got one of the worst names. I mean, Midori no Tiboku could have been called Dr. Corbin. That wouldn't have been as bad right. because it doesn't actually have the color in there. But the color is very brown red. It's a unique shade of red on Dr. Brown. Mm -hmm. It gives this plant a pretty unique shape. And most of the time in our houses, the leaf is a little more rounded and a little more spread out um, than many of the other lace leaves. So the leaf is a very pretty lace leaf as well. But the thing I like about this is this is one of the slower growing Japanese maples. Mm -hmm. We're talking four foot by five foot in 10 years. And like Matt talked about, I mean, this has got an amazing fall color. I mean, Dr. Brown, this is 
pretty amazing. I mean, the dude's got his degree. <laughs> to quote the late, great Mitch Hepburn comedian there, uh, the <laughs> Dr. Pepper joke, if you're not following along. <laughs> Dr. Brown's awesome, though. It's probably underutilized, probably because of the name, but it, it brings a lot of diversity to what lace leaves can do. And coming in at number 22, it had to be on our list. So at number 21, we've got Acer Palmatum Dissectum Sekimori. Yeah, Sekimori. I mean, J.D. Veritree says this is one of his favorite weeping lace leaves. I believe and, he actually says it's the best fall color lace leaf. And it it's up there for having an amazing, bright, golden yellow, crisp yellow fall color. Mm-hmm. But where this tree shines is it, it grows very, very wide and has a really nice arching spreading habit. Yeah, I... You know, if you want to describe the leaf, it's kind of between something like Midori no Teboku and Waterfall. So it's kind of in between those as far as how frilly it is. Uh, really durable. This one's done great in sun for us. Uh, you know, zones five through eight. You know, zones are really on how cold it gets. So they're not a perfect analogy. But I always let people know that they do work great for the East Coast. Uh, but this one tends to be one that does pretty well in most East Coast zone eights. You'll see exceptions to that. I always explain that. But California zone eight can be... Uh, totally different than East Coast Zone 8. So I've, you know, Aaron Dragseth in California in Zone 10 growing a lot of trees in full sun, but his heat index doesn't get too big. Uh, great way to look at it, though, for the East Coast is this one's very heat tolerant. It, it tends to grow out and do very well. Classic green. I love this one. Dad always described it as a highlighter in the garden right at dusk. So it's one my dad's been growing quite a while here. Um, he was growing this one in the 90s, and it was one of his favorite lace leaves. It was typically one of the greens he produced the most of. Uh, and he just loved it. You know, it really gets that highlightery chartreuse color in the early spring. And it, it really is one of the most unrivaled yellow fall colors. Now, it, this was one of our original green lace leaves that we offered here at Mr. Maple. I mean, back when we were Nichols Nursery doing different tailgate markets around, Seki Mori was the one that we really loved because it really, really gives you a nice crisp yellow fall color. Contrasts so well with many of the other uh, Japanese maples because mm. of that yellow fall color rather than an orange or red. But Seki Mori is an excellent Japanese maple. J.D. Veritrees often talks about putting Japanese maples up on banks so you can look up into the structure. And I know at Hillstone Arboretum, we've done a little bit of planting Japanese maples up higher so you can look up into the structure. Yeah, we had a neighbor but, cut some trees that fell on a few of them. But we do try to have some lace leaves there. And the idea in that garden, it's they're on rock walls, is that you could walk up underneath lace leaves. So you can kind of stand underneath them and get a whole different perspective. And I think that's what Veritrees was going for there too. Yeah, and I think it's a great way to grow, especially the weeping cascading types, because you can look into the structure, see the structure of the plants to really appreciate that weeping cascading habit. Mm-hmm. But it also gives the Japanese maple good drainage, which Japanese maples love good drainage. Right. And Sekimori is another one with a very arching habit. So it's going to have a lot of branches that are cascading and pendulous, yes, but they're very arching in their nature. So you get a very unique habit to it. It's a very easy one to prone uh, to prune into kind of a floating cloud or open. You can kind of open it up a little bit and see into it very easily. So it makes a nice structure for that. Um, it tends to be one that you can sometimes see into. It's not as dense as some of the others. Yeah. And I mean, second more is just a great weeping green lace leaf. I mean, coming in at, at 21, it's a solid, solid, solid one to have in your garden. Uh, number 20, this is probably one of the most common Japanese maples in America. At number 20, we have Acer Palmatum Dissectum, Crimson Queen. I, I was shocked and kind of thrilled to know that the Vercade family named this one. You know, Dave's a good friend of ours. Uh, we've mentioned Dave Vercade on this show before, if you've uh, you've ever watched any of our YouTube channel. Uh, the Vercade family actually came up with Crimson Queen, and I mean, it's a classic Japanese maple. It's one of the most highly sought after I mean, I know when we were doing wholesale, that was the tree everybody asked for when we were grafting. We used to do custom liners for a little while, and everybody wanted Crimson Queen. It's a name that people can say, but it's also a great plant. Now, I always let people know, in our opinion, Crimson Queen needs a little more late-day shade protection, uh, so it doesn't want to be in the full sun. Typically here in the deep south, you want to give this one some, you know, 3 or 4 o'clock at least on protection in that afternoon sun, sometimes even the 2 o'clock depending on how hot your zone is. Uh, But it is a gorgeous tree. And, I mean, it has some really deep shades of maroon, some of the darkest. And also, when it hits that fall color right, it is some of the most brilliant shades of crimson. Yeah, one of the things I love about Crimson Queen is that it can handle uh, more shade and still hold its color. Yeah. And it's one of the best Japanese maples at doing that. Also, I mean, you talk about names. I mean, Crimson Queen describes this tree very accurately because it gives a really good crimson fall color. 
And so it's the queen of fall whenever it gives that good crimson fall color. I mean, really picked up. I mean, I don't even know if crimson really describes it though. It's like a pink red. I mean, I've had some, I've had some seasons where it was one of the best fall color maples, the entire garden. And, uh, really, really nice, bright, bright, bright red. Now crimson queen tends to have a very full canopy. It tends to be one you don't see into a uh, very, very arching habit, you know, weeping habit to this one as well. Typically four by four, even in a 10 year period. So it's a little slower growing than some of the other ones on this list. Slow and wide, maybe even four by five in its habit. Yeah, I'd say almost four by six. I mean, it really gets some nice width to it, stays a little lower, and it's just a great tree out there in the landscape. All right, so coming in here at number 19, we have English Lace. Now, for my money, this is the best upright red lace leaf. It's the first one on our list here that's more of an upright tree than a weeping tree. Now, this one goes up and arches out a little bit, but it's still a very upright tree. I do tend to stake it when it's young. Uh, Jerry Childs named this one. Uh, he's a firefighter and just really cool guy. He sent this one early on to help us ev- to us to help evaluate it. There were a couple different seedlings. Uh, there was like an English Lace 1 and 2, and we kind of helped him pick which one we liked the best of the group, and then that one got named, which was fun. It was one of the first times I think a nurseryman sent us something very early on and to, to kind of help in that evaluation process. And uh, really a nice tree. I mean, I, I've been very impressed with it. I have some older ones in the landscape. They tend to really be upright and then arching out, which I think it makes them stand apart even from something like Lionheart that, that really has more of an upright habit. Yeah, there were plenty of Japanese maples that were billed as red uprights. Mm-hmm. And so many of those didn't make this list because English Lace did. I mean, mm-hmm. English Lace to us is the, the more superior, more upright tree. Again, any of these red lace leaves, unlike Seriu, you really need to point it upwards for the first little bit to let right. it start going upwards. But then it really has some really nice upright and arching habits to it. Yeah, and Lionheart makes a great tree as long as you know what it's doing. Lionheart's going to be up and then very much out. So it's it's more of an arching, faster growing, taller tree, where I think English Lace hits that more upright tree category a little bit more aptly. I thought it was cool because I know we got English Lace early. Mm-hmm. And then I know that you went to go visit Peter Gregory, and you said that he had an English Lace in the <laughs> container yeah, he had at his there. place. They were in their garden right there. Uh, it was a really cool trip. I got to go and visit uh, Peter Gregory and go around Western Bird Arboretum with him. And he had some different Japanese maples there just in containers. He had moved into a little apartment this time, and he didn't have a lot, but that was one of the ones he had there in a planter to uh, kind of, I guess, being you know, a proper Englishman, he had to have English Lace there in the landscape. So it was us and Peter Gregory that were evaluating this early <laughs> on. And I know a few other nurserymen had too, but it's, it's just cool to be involved in that process of doing, you know, getting to evaluate a tree and see which is which is the very best of the selections. Um, an amazing plant, though, typically gives some good fall color for mm. us. Um, it does green up a little bit during the summer, but there's not any red lace leaves currently that have as upright of a habit right. to compete with English lace that would hold its color better. Great red fall color, too. I mean, it's more of a, a scarlet again in the fall, so it's a bright picked up red in the fall from that maroon. Um, anything can get a little uh, green late. They start to store a little bit of chlorophyll right before that fall color. But, uh, you, you know, if you're wanting to stake this one up, get a taller tree, and even open up some of that branching with a little bit of pruning so you can see into it really well, uh, it's a really fun tree. You can play with the shapes. It's going to be very fast-growing. And it's just going to stand out from everything else on this list because nothing else gets – that big that's a red that quickly. So coming in at number 18, we have Acer Palmatum Dissectum Sweet Lorraine. How, how did this not get up further on the list? I think it made it further on our top 40 or top 50 Talon Buckholz introductions, maybe. I don't know. A, a, a newer one from our friend Talon Buckholz. We got this one pretty on pretty early on as well. Uh, Sweet Lorraine is pretty cool because it's kind of like a lace leaf ghost series tree. So think of this one as a reticulated you know, with some red colorations and you can kind of get some, you know, almost peaches and cream kind of back color on this one. You get that cool little lighter colored secondary color around the reticulated veining on this one. Really showy lace leaf. I would say a little slower growing than most as well. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, trying to think of the best way to describe this would almost be like an Olson's frosted strawberry lace leaf. Yeah. And it's cascading. It gives you some of that strawberry color first. And then goes to some of those creams, almost like the peaches and cream you were mentioning. Yeah, I can see that. Yeah, I can see that. I mean, so unusual because you get that reticulated variegation. And Mm -hmm. what we mean is you see the etching of the veins of the leaf that are one color. Right. And the rest of the leaf is another color. Yeah, there's a few we could have thrown in this category. We we did try to, you know, keep 
keep this list to some of our favorites of each category. I know Felis would have been right there with this one as a reticulated lace leaf as well. Uh, even maybe even slower grow than Sweet Lorraine. Both those are are fairly dwarf and make great compact trees. You know for containers because of that too. So not only is it weeping and dwarf, uh, it's going to look great in the container. You're going to be able to bring that variegated look back up into the uh, the patio. So coming in at number 17, Matt and I sort of disagreed about this one. This category sort of fits sort of that bald smith type. And for me, my money was on Watnong. Yeah, I, I mean, I like Watnong as well. I mean, I, the thing I like about Watnong is it's heat tolerance. It's, it's proven heat tolerance. This is kind of that orange spring color lace leaf category. I mean, orange to pink. Um, it's a, it's a multicolor. Like we often mess with people. Like we were asking Bill Shell and, and um, Ken Rogers a couple weeks ago when we were in Auburn and we were saying, is Watnong a red lace leaf with green color or a green lace leaf with red color? Cause it, it's got <laughs> so many things going on there. Uh, you know, I like it cause it's very heat tolerant. And again, this one's very arching. It's an odd shaped. I think even amongst this whole list, there's not a lot that are as wide as this one. I mean, it just makes a, an arching habit. That's very different looking. whatnong has been exceptionally heat tolerant. I, I could have easily seen putting Chantilly lace or Baldsmith in this spot. Uh, Chantilly lace is one of my favorites for that, that pink in the spring kind of has a yellow undertone to that pink, kind of like whatnong. I mean, it's oftentimes what you'll get on those when they first leaf out, especially if you've got them in morning sun and late day shade is a pink exterior with more of a yellow eye to it. And at Watnong certainly lights up the show with that. Uh, I w- I'd probably give the slight edge to Watnong for heat tolerance, but maybe the slight edge to Chantilly Lace for color. I can see that. I can see that. I know uh, our good friend, Pat Dye, who has passed away now, but he really loved Japanese maples. He had a nursery down in Alabama. He loved Watnong. I mean, he loved for it because he could get some orangey fall color out of it. He liked anything Auburn colored to start yeah, off with. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. But it was so heat tolerant. Yeah. Um, it's so unusual because that's a selection that was from Watnong Nursery, which was in New Jersey. Mm-hmm. And it's crazy that they introduced Watnong, and yet, you know, we've got it all around, you know, the United States today, and it's so heat tolerant. I mean, you wouldn't think of the heat tolerant Japanese maple being birthed out of New Jersey. It's stood the test of time. It's super durable. Um, you know, I, I've seen this one in full sun and a heavy zone eight in the South performing very well. Again, you saw nine customers. You definitely want to give this one some shade, but zones five through eight, it, it handles the sun like a champ does great in a container. I like the funky shapes it makes. It kind of just sends out, you know, kind of an irregular growth pattern. Uh, I mean, it's not square. Like I wouldn't call it square for a Japanese maple, but it's more squared off than a lot of the bell shapes that the other ones are making. Where a lot of those others I keep describing as a bell or an umbrella, uh, it certainly puts on more, you know, longer branches than it does just straight cascading. So it's yeah, a unique it, shape. It definitely gets some more horizontal growth to it with some arching to it, which is really nice. Now, whenever it comes to Chantilly Lace, I know that, that one has been a popular one for us. I know that we've got one mm-hmm. at Hillstone Arboretum where we've got plenty of amazing Japanese maple specimens, but we've got a Chantilly Lace there, and the color on there was just outstanding and exquisite. I know that. Uh, whenever we were honored and privileged to make it into Country Gardens Magazine, uh, they did a write-up, and one of the maples they featured then was Chantilly Lace. Mm-hmm. And it quickly became a very popular tree for mail order for us because there weren't a lot of other people caring at the time. But also, I mean, this is a plant from Red Maple Nurseries. I mean, this is a really mm-hmm. unique Japanese maple with a lot of of really that, that pink red kind of color. I would describe it as more of your classic, you know, a lot of people ask me how these are different and I would describe it more as your classic, you know, waterfall shape to uh Chantilly lace and maybe a little bit more pink. It might be the brighter pink of that group. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think so too. So my money is on what Nong Matt argued Chantilly lace. I could almost side with him on that, but the thing that edged it out for me with what Nong was that heat tolerance. I mean, for a lot of people in the South, this plant can really go down and really thrive and do well. And uh, I'm, that it's just got a lot, a lot of really great color. Uh, so number 16, Matt. Coming in here at number 16, we have Acer Palmatum Dissectum Firefall. Yeah. I mean, the thing I like about this is it's a picked up red. Mm-hmm. We're talking about a weeping red lace leaf, new on the market. I mean, a lot of people hadn't even caught on to this yet. Right. But soon as people do... This is likely going to become the new crimson queen. It's a it's a great plant. It hadn't hit the market. I mean, we, we're we're kind of 
probably one of the few people mail ordering it, and it hadn't really got out there as much as it should. I've really been impressed with this one in, you know, Augusta, South Carolina, in heavy sun, how well it's held its color late into the season. Uh, it's been one of those reds that's been really showy in a good bit of sun, you know, late into June and July in some of those hotter climates. They're a little muggier, and it's just held its color exceptional. Uh, it's also got really nice bright, bright red fall color. It's a newer lace leaf on the market, and, uh, you know, the fall color is what it's named for, but I think the spring and the summer color holds so well that it had to be a, had to deserve a place on this list. Now, this one's going to be a little bit more of your umbrella or bell shape. This one's a little bit more umbrella shaped, uh, a little bit wider than it is tall, typically about five by six in a 10-year period, low cascading umbrella, and uh, another great candidate for container gardening. I mean, this one's going to look perfect in a big pot. Yeah, and like I talked about earlier, there's a difference between this and something like you know some of the garnets and other red lace mm-hmm. leaves. I mean, it, one, it holds its color, but two, it's a different shade of red. Mm-hmm. I mean, we're talking that brighter picked-up red which is really unusual and really different for a lace leaf that can handle more sun. I mean, normally you think of that brighter picked up color, you think of something more like a Crimson Queen, but this is one that can handle more sun. And so I think it's got a great name. I think as soon as this tree gets out there on the market, you know, we may be looking in 25 years, 30 years, Mm -hmm. this is the dominant red lace leaf in the trade. I, I think it could be. I mean, uh, so that that's that's a lot. There's a lot to unseat there. There's a lot of great candidates ahead of it that are more well-known. But, uh, you know, it's it's been a great up-and-comer, and the colors have been exceptional. The durability has been exceptional. Uh, it's, it's a great candidate for, you know, one of the best all-around reds for sure. So coming up number 15, we've got another red. This one's going to be one that is really I, – I love this plant. Number – 15, Acer Palmatum Dissectum, Red Dragon. Yeah, a lot of people think this one comes from New Zealand. New Zealand might have made it more popular, but it's actually another one from our friend Dick Wolf. Uh, we don't really know Dick Wolf, but we think of him as a friend. We did a whole podcast. Uh, we did a whole breakdown on our uh, YouTube channel about Dick Wolf. Never never had the pleasure of meeting him, but uh, I would say somebody that inspires us a good bit. Uh, and Billy Schwartz, we'll have a podcast on him. You'll have to check that out. But he was the apprentice to Dick Wolf. And Red Dragon... Uh, you know, it's not one, I don't think he produced it enough for people to really know it was his. Like he, he did that tree and Emperor One's so much more well known, but it, it's, uh, ever bit as popular almost in some ways. I love the name red dragon. I mean, everything's in a name. It's one but, people can say, but for me, it's the fire glow of lace leaves. That's a great, that's and, a great way of describing it. And the reason it is, is because it gets orange red to the backside of the leaf in full sun. Right. And then when the wind blows, this plant looks like it's on fire. Mm -hmm. I mean, it has that glowing effect to it. Right. And it is so bright in full sun. I know a lot of people in the deep South love red dragon because it holds its color very well. Right. But I also like it because it is a slower growing red lace leaf. Yeah. It's It's not as vigorous as something like a Nobstari or Tamukiyama. Mm -hmm. It stays much, much smaller, great for containers and holds its color extremely well. Typically about four feet tall, but about five feet wide, even in 10 years. It's exceptional in the heat tolerance. This is one you typically can see into the structure of, so it's a little bit more opened up. I don't know if it was Billy. It might have been Elizabeth Mundy who told me, but they showed me, and you can't unsee it once you see it, but the the lace leaf in hand can kind of resemble that of a Chinese dragon. So you can take the back two petioles that kind of look like the horns, and it's a bearded dragon there when you look at the face of it. Uh, really fun, especially, you know, kids love stuff like that when you can show them that, that leaf, and it kind of looks like a face going on there. Really cool plant to be growing, though, and it's classic for so many reasons. I think the fire glow analogy is perfect, not only because it's a medium-sized lace leaf, but for the color patterns it goes through as well. So coming at number 14, we've got one by Del Laux. We're talking Lucky Sevens. <laughs> right. We're talking Lemon Lime Lace. Yeah, Tim, uh, Tim, we were once purchasing some plants from Del Laux. <laughs> this was probably back in 09, and it just said LLL, but he had the uh, – the label upside down. So he said, what's this lucky number seven, this seven, seven, seven. <laughs> and it was just upside down LLL for lemon lime lace. Now we had to get this one in here because of its uniqueness. So, I mean, it's, it's got some color pattern changes that you don't see. It makes it stand out amongst a lot of these other types, uh, you know, good weeping habit. This one is going to be more umbrella shaped overall. And it's just got that relaxing, cool green color. 
Yeah, I mean, it gives you some green color. The Nugo flushes are a little more yellow green to it, which gives this tree something very unique and different. You get some nice yellows, most of the yellows with some oranges in the fall. Uh, a competitor to this would be Lemon Chiffon. Right. I mean, those are those are the could two. Could have been most, on the list as well. Could have been on the list as well. Didn't make the list because Lemon Lime Lace was on here. But this just has a really nice cascading habit. But the color pattern on this is what really sets this one apart. Yeah, it's a yellowy. I mean, it's it's got that that sprite factor, right? It's lemon plus lime. It's got the uh, it's got that yellowy green spring chartreuse color going on. Tends to be a denser plant. Tends to be one that unless you're opening it up, it, it does get full like crimson queen. Like you're not seeing all the way into it. Uh, really a beautiful plant though. It's a great candidate for container gardening. Uh, we listed about four feet by five feet in a ten year period, so it's right in the middle for lace leaves on the growth rate. Super nice, uh, excellent showy yellows to oranges in the fall. When I think about this plant, I think about when we were at our first Maple Society meeting and Richard Bomar walked up to us and slid Del Lauk's contact right. information across the table like and walked away. Secret nuclear codes he was passing us. He just slid this across the table. We open it up and it has Del Lauk's with a phone number and an address. I know. Like, we give him the whole, you know, thank you. And, and we had to go visit him. And then we show up at his nursery, and he's got liners on liners, grafted liners. And it's just looking through, trying to find what is cool, unique, what I didn't have, what was mm-hmm. different. And that's when we ran across the hand. He always had handwritten labels, the Lucky Sevens. So that's what I think about every single time when uh, I think about Lemon Lime Laces, that 777 seven, seven on the label. But such a good plant, and it really deserves a lot of – it really deserves – to be used more in the landscape because it really gives a lot of unique color. So next up here at number 13, we've got Acer Palmatum Dissectum Mariel. Now this one's named for our good friend, Mariel Eichemann's recent winner of the Peter Gregory award, a uh, long time uh, treasurer for the North American Maple Society. So shout out to Mariel. Uh, her husband, Bart named this one for her. Bart has a great eye for finding Japanese maples. Uh, they're there in Port Angeles and Bart has found so many cool plants, and you know it's special if he's named it after his wife, right? You don't you yeah. don't name your your B grade when that's your top line, and uh, Marielle really really fits that. It's it's a beautiful lace leaf with a purple border to it, and what we liked about this one is that it's probably held the border the longest for any of the green lace leaves with purple border types for us. Yeah, I mean one of the competitors here was was Spring Delight. Yeah, and they both have that sumagaki like feel to right, it. Right, right. And we're talking like a sumagaki lace leaf almost. And Marielle, for us, has really showed that purple-red border much later into the season mm-hmm. than Spring Delight does. Spring Delight gives you some really good spring color. We've had Marielle hold it late spring, early summer. Yeah. And the leaf shape is very unique as well. The leaf is a little more intricate than some of the other lace leaves. Mm-hmm. Um, but this is such a good spreading Japanese maple with a little bit more of an open habit than some of the other lace leaves. Yeah. I would describe it as, you know, typically a four to five foot tall by equally as wide, maybe even a little bit wider in a 10 year period, more of that low cascading umbrella. Um, it's we've, we've actually described it almost sometimes more as a fuchsia purple. Like it's a weird color. It's got a lot going on there. Uh, the border is thick and, and very noticeable making it, strikingly interesting, especially if you're standing over top of this cultivar and you're looking down into it in the spring, it is, you know, so lime green and so purple at the same time. It looks like somebody colored it. I mean, it doesn't look real. It looks like an unreal made up plant. And when you heard me, if you're not familiar with a lot of Japanese maples and you're like, what's that sumagaki cultivar? It's a cultivar that the name translates as red nails or red fingernails. Mm -hmm. And it's poetic. The Japanese often have some really great poetic names to their Japanese maples. And it's because it looks like someone painted a tree's fingernails. I mean, that's that's what it is. And that's exactly what this one does with that margins of that purple red, that fuchsia red. Really makes this tree have something really unique, really special in the springtime that helps it stand out from the crowd. Uh, it's a showstopper. It's one we can't do enough of here. Uh, it, you know, we didn't name it or really introduce it, but as nurseries, we've been like the first nursery to offer it. So we've kind of helped popularize it here at Mr. Maple and, uh, you know, we, we like Bart and Muriel too, so it's a, it's a special tree for us because uh, it's named after one of our good friends. So coming at number 12, Acer Palmatum, Dragon's Fire. Guys, this, you know, talk about a tree having a perfect name. I think Dragon's Fire is like the perfect name for this plant. 
it looks like just shooting right straight out of a dragon's mouth. I mean, it's got <laughs> spring color has so much going on there. It's got a million color shades in it. It's, it's yellowish, it's orangish, it's reddish in the spring. You know, I'd put it in that ornatum kind of group for, for dissectums. Yeah. And I think the competitors here were for the spot were ornatum, Miyun. I mean, we've got a number of different ones right. that had, that were competitors for this, but Dragon's Fire, I mean, everything's in a name. Right. Dragon's Fire's got a fantastic name, but it really does have a really unique, more picked up color. It's got some in the baller spring. colors. I mean, it's hard to beat. And then for the, uh, you know, really some of those orangey kind of colors with some green eyes. Then in the fall, when it lights up with yellows and oranges in the fall, mm -hmm. it really, you can see where it gets the name of Dragon's Fire, especially with that fall color. One thing I really like about this one is on the new growth, sometimes you can get kind of yellowish stems. And I think it adds to the color of the lace leaf. Like you get that yellow green orangey, goes. you know, fiery exterior going on. It's almost like the center of the flame. Yeah. Like you get that green, like yellow green stemming going on, especially on the new growth in the summer. And it just adds to that overall color. Bold orangey reds in the fall as well. So still the fall color looks like fire. I mean, it really sets fire in the fall as well. And one that's going to be a little lower, typically more of a three by six in a 10 year period. So it's a little shorter and a little wider, uh, you know, it fits in a lot of spaces. You know, Tim often likes to tell people trees like this work great under a window seal or in an area where you don't want something that's going to be too big. The same can be said for something like that emerald lace for trees that are going to make more of a width and a height shape. You know, you can put them in areas where you want to be able to see over that always, and it's going to be a great candidate for something that's not going to get super big. Yeah. So coming at number 11, Acer Pomatum Dissectum Filigree. We're talking about the original reticulated Lace leaf Japanese maple. Right. You'll see this one sometimes listed as green filigree because there is a red filigree. Uh, this one is going to be distinctly different. I mean, green filigree and red filigree couldn't be really much more different. Green filigree has a very large leaf and it's, you know, for lack of a better term, again, it's kind of one that looks like a reticulated lace leaf. So you're getting kind of that ghost series type variegation, that reticulatum group variegation on a lace leaf. Now, if you can give this one a good bit of uh, late day shade, you can really pick that flaking up. You can get kind of these like really speckled looks in it, especially in the early spring. It's already one of the crispest light green colors you can possibly have. So it's a, a special color already because it's like lime green with white variegation within it. I'm going to keep up my comparisons. It's the sister ghost of lace leaves. Uh, you know, great comparison. And it really gives you some really nice fall colors of yellows to oranges as well. I mean, I've really seen some of the best fall colors out of this lace leaf. You got to give it some protection from that hot afternoon sun. It does not like to be in full sun, mm -hmm. but this is a plant that just is a rock star. That white flecking, that ghost-like variegation in the springtime is something very truly unique, very different. And on a green lace leaf, this gives a very lively feel, especially in the spring garden. You can get some pictures of this one in the early spring that just don't look real. I mean, it's already a larger leaf. It's a smaller tree, but it's a larger leaf. And that reticulated variegation in there is spectacular. You know, we typically lift it, list it as a four footer over time, you know, four to five foot wide, even in a 10 year period. Uh, my dad has one of these. It's probably 20 years old. It's probably four by six or four by seven there at the entrance way uh, to his uh, driveway or actually at the entrance way to his porch. And it gets a good bit of shade from one of the dogwoods right there in the porch itself. And so when it glows, it glows. I mean, that thing really lights up the spring garden. Excellent in the fall color, too. I mean, you can get some really nice shades. It, it, it is one of the best yellow fall colors out there. I mean, you can get some just unreal shades of yellow in that as well. And sometimes you can even see a little bit of that reticulation shining through in the fall color. So with filigree, green filigree, sometimes the new growth flushes during the summer can have very unusual, deeply cut leaves that look very different from the older growth. Mm -hmm. And people are always like, hey, what's going on here? You know, that's very typical on whenever you're looking at Japanese maples, you really have to look at older mature growth to be able to tell, you know, what is which tree um, because older mature growth is the only way that you can identify a Japanese maple. Right. But on filigree, some of the summer flushes can really be heavily divided and very unique and stand out. And you may think you have something like a sport or something, but that can be typical with some of the summer flushes on Acer Palmatum Dissectum filigree. But always remember whenever you're trying to identify a Japanese maple, you're trying to say, hey, compare Japanese maples, you want to choose the typical leaf from older growth. Right. I mean, new growth can help identify sometimes as well, 
but typically you're wanting to identify it with the typical growth on older growth because new growth can definitely be deceiving. I like your comparison to uh, Sister Ghost because of the serrated edges this one has. It has a very serrated, sharp-looking edges to the lace leaf. It really gives it something extra. really looks very jagged. Uh, and just really colorful with that pattern. Now, de definitely one you want to give late day shade to. It's going to work zones five through nine, but you want to protect it from those hotter zones and full sun. And you're just going to pick up that variegation later into the season. You're going to have more white flecking and white variegation within it if you're giving it some heavier shade. All right, guys, coming in at number 10, it's another one of my dad's favorites. Uh, probably my dad's favorite Japanese maple, at least, at least the Japanese maple my dad sold the most of in the 80s and 90s. We're looking here at... The top 10. Yeah, yeah, we're into the top 10. Top 10. Get, and if you're listening to this, think about what your top 10 lace leaves would be. If you're watching this on YouTube, go ahead and uh, in the live chat, comment down there what your top 10 lace leaf Japanese maples are. I mean, we have went from 25, well, we've really went through all the lace leaves that we carry mm -hmm. down to number 10. And number 10 is one of our dad's favorite red lace leaves. I know Brian will love this one in Oklahoma because of its heat tolerance. Acer palmatum, Inaba shidari. Now, Inaba is a region in Japan. Shidari is a very frequently used word meaning weeping. So you get that shidari describing the shape. Uh, this one for most people is exactly what they're looking for in a Japanese maple. When most people come to us and they say, hey, I'm interested in purchasing a Japanese maple, Inaba shidari is probably closest to what they have in mind. Yeah, and I love this plant. It really has a nice cascading habit. You can really get some lavender colors out of this mm -hmm. that is very unique to some of the lace leaves. And it's not every year. Some years it's more maroon. But some spring colors, you can really get some picked up lavenders in full sun with Anabas Shadari. And, I mean, I love what we did at Maplewood Gardens. We take Anabas Shadari and we plant some golden sedum or creeping jenny down below it. Right. And then you've got the spring contrast between the Anabas Shadari mm -hmm. and that golden sedum. Yeah, I mean, it, it's a it's a great lace leaf. Uh, it's typically a little fuller than some of the others. It's a nice grower. It's a little more vigorous than something like Crimson Queen. I like to stake this one up and let it wheat from its uppermost point. You know, with a lot of these lace leaves, if you want to pick up the gross rate, you just you just stake them. By staking one of these trees, you can get a much taller tree quicker. In fact, in, in my parents' garden, I have an Anabish Shadari that we staked to about 10 feet tall. And it wouldn't be that tall in like 20 years on its own. We've staked it up and then let it weep down from there, so it's an easy one to manipulate the shapes of. You can get a much taller tree quicker by staking up a strong central leader to this one. And from that uppermost part, you're going to start to form an umbrella. That's how it works. So if you keep staking it up, you're just going to get a bigger tree. Nabishtari classic for its growth rate. It does get a little green late in the season, so this one certainly can green up for you in those hotter zones, but it doesn't burn. It's excellent at its durability and it really lights up with that fall color. I've had some really impressive shades of neon to bold red on this one in the fall. Uh, excellent lace leaf for texture, color, you know, leaf shape. All around, it's just a great grower. I think it's exactly what people think of when they think, I'd like to have a lace leaf Japanese maple, or like, I know what Japanese maples are. I saw one one time. You know, I'd throw Garnet in this category uh, as a runner-up to this one, maybe even fairly similar Red Select, sometimes mixed in there as well. Uh, but Anaba Shidari, awesome tree. My dad probably sold more of this one than any other Japanese maple he ever offered. That that, that was dad's classic. He had Anaba Shidari's in one gallons and three gallons and seven gallons for years. And it was one he couldn't keep in stock. I mean, he, he sold out of every, every Anaba Shidari he could graft. And for good reason. I mean, it's it's tough. It's durable. It's vigorous. It's, it's going to go in full sun up to zone eight and do really well. Now, again, the more sun you're giving this one, it can green up a little bit midsummer. I, I love an Shadari. I've got so many good memories from being at Tailgate Market selling this plant. Right. To people, I, people might not know that if you didn't see the history of Mr. Maple. We, we're, we're a mail order business, and we've grown a little bit. We're still small, but we did start out selling at Tailgate Markets, uh, you know, trying to make some gas money to get home. <laughs> and I, I remember just selling this one and really enjoying it, going out and seeing it each and every week. I mean, Grandma had one of these in her garden, right. which is now over at Maplewood Gardens. Uh, we had s so many great memories of this, but my favorite memory of this is Adobe Shadobi. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, Carolina, we, we did a video. You'll have to check it out on YouTube. Uh, my daughter's turning six in a few weeks, which which is blowing my mind. I'll have a six-year-old, a four-year-old, and a one-year-old little boy. So my, my family's grown quite a bit over the years. Uh, Carolina's my oldest, and we had her – 
in the uh, Naba Shadari video, and Tim kept trying to get her to say Inaba Shadari, and she, <laughs> bless it. I mean, she was three. <laughs> it was not working. We were trying to get this cute little kid in there to say Inaba Shadari, and I, I was like, you know what will be much funnier if we just catch what she's actually saying? So we, we got Carolina there lined up, and I said, all right, say Inaba Shadari, and she says, Obi Spadobi. <laughs> and so, yeah, that one sometimes gets called Obi Spadobi now around Nailed our it. house. Yeah, right. Uh, but but that, that, that's my favorite memory. It, we we like to have a lot of our family in our in our. We're a small family, middle order business. We're bro, Matt and I are brothers, and we often. I mean, in the hot blonde video, your wife introduces it. The Geisha Gone Wild. My wife introduces it, and it's awesome to be able to have our family involved in our business. And uh, oh, who knows? I've got two girls. It might be Mrs. Maple one day. We'll see. If, we'll see if the little guy gets involved there. <laughs> we named it after our dad anyway. Was where the Mister Maple comes from. So it's actually named for Grandpa. As they call him Pawpaw, but uh, coming in at number nine here, we've got red filigree lace. Now, sometimes just referred to as red filigree. Um, this tree is excellent for so many reasons, and there's a reason why it's at number nine. It's one of the smallest lace leaves in our category. It's super dwarf, definitely takes a while. I mean, if you want a five foot tree of this, it's going to be a few years. It is a true dwarf lace leaf. Now, competitors to this one, we've got red feathers, also known as Ryla's red or Ryla's. Uh, red feathers. Mm-hmm. Um, we've also got ruby lace. Yeah, I mean those are might some, be the same plant, maybe. It we those are competitors with red filigree lace. Mm-hmm. We know that Ryla's red, also known as red feathers, was found as a seedling from burgundy lace at yeah. Nancy Vermeulen's. And I'm guessing that many of these ones were found as chance seedlings off of burgundy lace. That's mm-hmm. just a that's just a hunch because often you can find similar genetics. Now red filigree lace is popular not only for being small but having the most thinly dissected leaves of any of the lace leaves. So this lace leaf has some of the thinnest, darkest foliage that's super small. One of the reasons it really stands out to me, not only is it super small, it holds that dark red color even in heavy shade. So, you know, this one works in sun up to zone eight in most zones, uh, but you'll be surprised. You can put this one in a patio planter. You can put it, I actually gave this one to my Aunt Patty, and she has it in a patio planter in heavy shade, and it still stays dark maroon. It doesn't need a lot of sun to pick up that red. It's dark red, even in extreme shade conditions. You know, if you have a shade garden and a lot of your lace leaves are greening up on you because you're just not getting enough light, think about red filigree lace. Now, you don't want to put this one next to a lot of big hostas or something because it is a slow grower and a dwarf. But if you've got an area where you want a, a dark red, but it's too much shade for most things to be dark red, red filigree lace is your tree. Yeah, I love red filigree lace. The reason it edged out... For- for us over some of these other selections is because like what Matt mentioned, it holds its color well throughout the summer. Now, something like Ryla's red or red feathers might be easier for many grafters to graft. It is it produces tricky. thicker wood, but red filigree lace produces very thin, much harder to graft wood. So you see it less in the nursery trade than you think you would because it isn't the very easiest tree to graft. I know we sent some sign wood to Billy Schwartz and we'd send him off sign wood off of one gallons and he was like, man, this is the biggest wood I've ever seen right. on red filigree lace. And that's how you have to do it sometimes. I mean, sometimes as a tree gets older, it's got less, you know, new growth on it. You have to trim it to produce sign on this one. And sometimes producing from those younger plants really makes a big difference. Uh, tricky tree to produce, one we actually offer a lot here at Mr. Maple. Super durable, though. It's a great plant. And the colors are spectacular. It's hard to photograph because the leaf is so dainty and frilly and small. You almost have to put your hand behind it to get a good picture of it because it's so little. Put a white sheet of paper or something behind it to get all those intricacies. If there was a red fairy here, it's the lace leaf version of it. (laughs) It's got that thin thread leaf foliage that is very unique and very different. Uh, One thing I don't want to, whenever you plant this, I've learned, you don't want to put something that's like red mulch underneath it. It can get lost. If you put something that is a ground cover that's very small that has some color to it. Angelina Sedum works great. Yeah, you you can really appreciate the leaves a lot more from looking down above it. And this is one of the slowest growing lace leaves that we offer. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is a very, very slow grower, and it's great for those small spaces, great for those patio planters like you mentioned. Mm -hmm. Um, Red filigree lace coming at number nine, that is a solid tree, very unique and very different. All right, so staunchly different here at number eight, we've got Acer Palmatum Dissectum Seriu. Yeah, this is one of the fastest growing up, and it's upright Seriu. Yeah. It's the it's one of the only upright lace leaves on the market. I mean, a competitor to this would be Judith Ann. Yeah, seedling not a, from it. Seedling from it, uh, found by Donnie Tomlin. 
but Siryu itself is vigorous mm-hmm. and it it's out there in the nursery trade. It's not uncommon for this tree to put on over a foot and a half of growth a year. Uh, and again, this is distinctly an upright. It's a strong upright grower. It's a great tree for many people to plant because it shades out a lot of their younger trees and smaller trees. The name Siryu means blue green dragons. And we often wondered why that was. You might've heard me say it before because we put it in sun a lot because it's tough as nails and it often can provide shade for smaller Japanese maples with its vigor. Uh, when this one matures out, as it starts to get older, you can shade it out some. So the older growth will, the newer growth will actually shade out some of that older growth and it starts to get some of those emeraldy colors and, and those bluer shades and a uh, really nice tree. Now, if you're growing it in heavy sun, it's bright chartreuse green uh, and exceptional bold red fall color. It's one we actually saw at temples in Japan being used for its fall color. There weren't a lot of cultivars at some of these temples, but Seryu stood out and I mean, it was intensely bold red and you know, it's one of those fun things too, because not only are you growing a green lace leaf, you're getting that diversity of color in the fall garden. Now, Seryu, like you said, the name means blue green dragons. We always think of this as a classic Japanese maple. And we often think of it in terms of things like Tamukiyama, but it's not as old a cultivar as Tamukiyama. Yeah. It was an introduction by Wada Nursery in Japan. And they actually uh, brought it to the United States and it was imported to the National Arboretum in the early 1960s. And then it became popular in the nursery trade because of its vigor, mm-hmm. because of its heat tolerance, and because of that good fall color. And it's, it's the only upright lace leaf. I mean, this tree is very unique, very different. We mentioned before, uh, whenever we were talking about emerald lace, they might share some relation. Mm-hmm. And Seryu is a Acer palmatum subspecies palmatum. And Matt was the one who pointed out to me. He's like, Tim, look at these seeds. The seeds are really small. Yeah, they don't fit Matsumuri. They don't fit that category. Matsumuri seeds are typically very large. Um, you know, Seryu seeds have that, that, that seed that's more in line with your, your typical Acer palmatum subspecies palmatum, maybe even a little bit smaller. Uh, very unique tree. Great, great fall color, though. I mean, underrated fall color. Uh, Judith Ann was a contemporary of this we put on there. That was a seedling that has more yellowish color that we offer here from time to time. Another distinctly upright tree uh, in that category. But Seryu is the OG. Seryu is the you know the first upright lace leaf and definitely the most popular. Yeah, Seryu, awesome tree. If you're in a high heat area and you want to grow a Japanese maple and you've got some room for a larger upright tree, Seryu is an excellent, excellent tree for you. Um, love what this tree can do out in the landscape. Make some excellent, excellent, excellent specimens. I mean, I start to think about some of the specimens we saw at Seriputuk Gardens, and they've got numerous Seriyus out there in their garden. Mm-hmm. And everywhere you go, you've got amazing Seriyus. I mean, we go to the Richards Gardens over in Flat Rock. Amazing Acer Palmatum Dissectum Seriyu. And it's amazing because this tree makes a great tree wherever you plant it, makes a beautiful shape and just has that airy feel being it's a lace leaf with an upright habit. For sure. All right. Now coming in here at number seven, this is one, uh, you know, I'd love to see more done in the nursery trade. It's one we certainly try to do more of, but they sell out quickly because again, there's not a lot of them. Uh, this is one I learned through NJ Acer, Ed Shin, uh, and that number seven is Acer Palmatum Dissectum Edgewood. And I have seen this one sold before as Edgewood Orange. Mm -hmm. I think when All Things Acer was uh, going, Fred Hooks had actually put Edgewood Orange on it to sort of give it something because it does have a good orange fall color. Mm -hmm. But this is a spectacular, spectacular tree. Found found and introduced by Dick Wolf of Red Maple Nurseries. It actually came from Edgewood Cemetery Mm -hmm. as a chance seedling. And that plant is amazing. I mean... It really has some really nice, really nice reddish orange color to it, but then it has sort of gold tipping to it in the spring that Ed has. I would almost, I would almost describe it as a violety purple. Sometimes, I mean, yeah. some springs you get like a more purple than maroon color on this one for a lace leaf, with uh, again light colored stemming uh, that can fade to a more orangey maroon, like Tim's saying, and then staunchly different fall color. I mean, you're going from that violety purple to, to maroon to, with, with orange in it to then a golden yellow orange in the fall. I've had it be extremely yellow to bold orange. 
Uh, you know, it typically gets even some of the best shades of orange there in the fall garden. It's underrated. I think it contrasts so well with a lot of the other lace leaves. You know, a lot of people have a lace leaf in their garden. They might have a green or a red. Edgewood stands out so strongly against those. Uh, it's typically going to be a five by six in a 10 year period. So more of your typical umbrella shape, you know, lace leaf, it's a little bit fuller. Uh, I like to think of it as similarly growing to that of something like a Nabi Shadari and its habit, but underrated, underrated tree. I mean, it should be used more underrated for sure. My favorite thing. I know Ed talks about it too, is he, fo- his photograph when it's leafing out, it has that sort of that orange red to purple red color you're talking about, but those, the ends of the sublobes can get an orange tipping to it. Mm-hmm. And it really gives the plant something really unusual and different as this tree's leafing out. But the fall color, I mean, it's electric. It's got a lot going on for it. It's, 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 uh, it's underutilized. Uh, I know Ed gave uh, Tom Cox one. It was one of our top uh, Japanese maples at Tom Cox video. And Tom loves the plant. He's got it in a prominent area where you can get to it and check it out. And uh, it's one that I think is more people have it in their landscape. It becomes more of a connoisseur plant. Everybody wants that one. So going from one orange plant to another one at number six, we've got Jetalo orange. Or really should be pronounced Yetalo orange because it was named after Yetalo nursery. Um, but often pronounced in the nursery trade as Jetalo orange. Another dang underrated tree. I mean, this thing's so underrated. It is amazing. It, it definitely has more of that eye feel to it in the early spring where you kind of have a yellow almost eye in the center of it with purplish orange growth. I mean, there's so much going on. How do you describe the color of this tree? You'll have to look it up on Mr. Maple. Put in uh, Jetalo orange. I, Tell me what color this tree is. It's, it's so many different colors, it's hard to say. The fall color is a very striking, bold orange, and that's where really the name uh, gets the orange in there. But in the spring, there's shades of purple, there's shades of yellow, there's shades of orange. We're talking the Mila of lace leaf Japanese maples. Tim's big on the comparisons today, but he's coming through with them. <laughs> I, I like this comparison. It, it, it is the Mila of lace leaves. It, it brings it in the spring, but uh, you know that fall color, I, I don't know. The fall color is really special. Yeah, and the unique colors on this plant give you that orangey pink with that green-centered eye in the springtime. Mm -hmm. The habit on this plant is pretty spectacular, too. It really has a nice uh, horizontally weeping habit to it as well. We've got a good video we did with this tree in fall color at Criticosis Garden in Flat Rock, North Carolina. So you can go on YouTube, uh, pull up Mr. Maple, Jetalo Orange, and see a specimen out in the landscape in fall color. I mean, this plant is underutilized. Again, it stands out from many of the other lace leaves mm-hmm. because of its unique color, but the fall color is just electric. We, we typically list this one as four to five feet tall by about six feet wide. Uh, really nice cascading canopy to it. You know, it's going to be very pendulous as most of these lace leaves are with a few exceptions. This one has a phenomenal shape to it. That, that kind of umbrella shaped dome, and it makes the perfect palette for all that color. I mean, guys, I, I love that that spring color even more than the fall color because that interior of the leaf just has such a unique eye to it. Like, it's it's not really a bordered tree as much as it's like an interior eye, right? I mean, the border's the whole thing, and then you've got these sharp yellow, yellowish lines. I mean, they're probably more yellow even than green. And then late summer, it can almost be like a – it's I don't want to say blue-green, but it is more of that green – blue kind of color late summer. The sublobes on this too are not in its existence. I mean, there's more of the leaf shape of like a Midori no Tiboku. It's a long the, leaf, very elongated. His, very elongated on the leaf. And so it's very unique in every aspect when it comes to yellow orange. Mm-hmm. All right, guys, we're getting into the top five. Give us your top five lace leaf Japanese maples. Be thinking about where your top five are. You know, these are going to get heated, right? I mean, these are we're down to the top five lace leaves. That's what, one of the most popular categories. What do you think Matt and I voted as our number one lace leaf? Yeah, it, it, uh, it might surprise you. Uh, coming in at number five, we have Acer Palmatum Dissectum Waterfall. Now, Waterfall, so classic. It was actually a tree found by a waterfall at an estate in New Jersey. It is a beautiful Japanese maple. It is highly sought after. You know, one for the name. People, people think of that name aptly describes what this does. It's a pendulous weeping tree with, you know, a cascading habit. What better name could you have for a a Japanese maple that's weeping than waterfall? And not only do people want to plant this beside waterfall, it pairs so well 
with every red lace leaf. This is the green that has that classic golden yellow to orange fall color. And it pairs well with most people's first Japanese maple being a red. I mean, this is a classic Japanese maple. It grows so well in most gardening zones. The name aptly fits it because it has that weeping waterfall like appearance. And I mean, this is a very awesome green Japanese maple. Yeah. And this is heat tolerant guys. This is going to go out and do great in full sun and a heavy zone eight. You know, typically this one's going to be a five by five or even a five by six in that low weeping habit. Uh, typical, you know, more like the Anabas Shadari and its habit. It's kind of like the green version of that Anabas Shadari grower where it's going to be low and weeping and durable as all get out. Amazing fall color, uh, bright chartreuse green in the early spring fading to more of a Kelly green midsummer. And then fall can go from yellow to electric orange. Now I would say it's yellows more early and that's really what, what captures the eye of those bright yellows. Uh, but it can get some really nice shades of orange undertones in that as well. Uh, really underrated classic for a container. A lot of people are going to have, you know, multiple patio planters and they're going to have their crimson queen or their novice Shadari, And they're going to have that flanked by a really nice waterfall because it looks perfect with those. I mean, the color contrast, you're getting a similar texture, but distinctly different colors going on there. And uh, there's some years it's been our most popular tree on Mr. Maple. It's actually beat out Makawi Etsabusa in some years for our highest selling tree. Now, our competitors to this were Veritas and Green Mist. And Veritas and Waterfall, they're very, very similar. Green Mist typically goes to some really nice oranges in the fall, selection by Dick Wolf. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, when it comes to Waterfall, I think it really won out mainly because of its popularity. Yeah, Veritas, uh, it used to be a distinctly separate cultivar. I would say in many categories, especially even in Europe, it's come to be like Veritas Group. Even though Veritas is its own cultivar, we list we li- keep them listed separately here. Some people capture a lot of greens in that group, kind of like Atropoporum for reds. Yeah, so, so whenever Japanese maples were brought from Japan, originally all the green lace leaves were considered the Veritas group. Yeah. And Waterfall would have been a Veritas group selection that happened at this New Jersey State Park, this uh, estate, at a waterfall. And so those two are very, very similar. Green Mist is the, the one that is a little more different with it. But Waterfall, it won out for number five because of its because of its popularity, and it's got a great name. Vigor, growth, habit, heat tolerance, it's really got it all. Uh, it's, it's one of our most popular green lace leaves. And it's always in our top sales every year, to be honest with you. It's always very popular and highly sought after. All right, coming in here at number four. We've got Acer Palmatum Dissectum Hanamatoe. Wow, guys, we made it all the way to number four before we started listing variegated. Well, I guess we listed some reticulated, but a, a variegated pink on red lace leaf. Now, I'll go ahead and beat Tim to it. He's making all the comparisons. This one's the Lillian Jewel. Lillian's Jewel of Lace Leaves. Uh, this one's got the pink on red. A lot of people confuse it with Lillian's Jewel one when because when just of the color patterns of the two. This one in a little bit more sun. You want to give it early morning sun. If you're giving it much early morning sun, you can get a lot of bright pink on dark red. So you'll get a more picked up color if you're getting that bright pink on dark red coloration. It actually surprisingly handles a good bit of sun. I've seen it in full sun in zone eight. So it can handle a little bit more sun than you would expect for a variegated Japanese maple. Yeah, whenever we were trying to write descriptions for this plant, Matt and I always do a lot of research. And Hana means flower. And Matoi, we couldn't find any really good description of what this was. We kept thinking it meant like you're like a flower of a personality. And that's a great way to think of this plant. Oh, this is a flower of a personality. <laughs> it's not it at all. <laughs> yeah, so we went and visited Tsukasa Maple at, in Japan. And he actually introduced this. It was found as a chance seedling from Toyama Nishiki. Mm-hmm. And Hanamatoe, it's just got more picked up colors with it. I mean, the colors are outstanding. But in the Edo period, the firemen were sort of the heroes of the area. Right. Era. The samurai look the samurai looked up to it, the firemen. You gotta think everything is made out of wood. Paper and, houses, paper doors. Yeah. And so when a fire happens, everybody's worried. Well, they would carry these mop like totems in front of the firemen to let people know it's the fire alarm. Hey, right. That was like the flashing lights of the day. And they're still used in many uh, ceremonies today. And it's basically saying a flower Matoi. So a a flower mop like totem with that hanging branches, Mm -hmm. which describes the weeping habit of Hanamatoi. Beautiful tree. I mean, now if you get this one in heavy shade, it's going to be more of a white 
on pink on light green. So if you're getting this one in heavier shade, you're going to get more green tones. That, that bold red tends to be more soft green with white and pink in it. You'll still get some pink, interestingly enough. It almost gets more three-colored and heavy shade. But if you're getting this one in sun, you're going to get way more dark pink on bold red. Yeah, Hanamatoi, I mean, that, that bold red color you can get if you give it more sunlight. I think that's really one of the things that distinguishes this cultivar from something like a Goshiki Shidari or mm. a Toyama Nishiki. But, I mean, if you're trying to compare this with something like a uh, pink ballerina. Yeah. I mean, it's it's a tough comparison between the two. Much and, more vigorous. I and, mean, much and, more vigorous and, than pink and, ballerina. And that's why Hanamatoi gets number four in my book, yeah. is because it's more vigorous than than pink ballerina, um, and it's more out there in the nursery trade. I think more people can get a hold of a Hanamatoi than they can a pink ballerina right now. Pink ballerina is neat. It comes from Yonker Nursery in, in the UK. I went and visited them one time. Really nice people. Karen Yonker spent the day showing me around some of her arboretums there and uh, really just really cool place. Peter Gregory also had a really nice pink ballerina going on there in the containers. Uh, so really fun plant, definitely a much smaller and less vigorous plant than the Hanamatoe. I have a bigger Hanamatoe in my landscape. Uh, it was one we brought over from the Highland Creek nursery buyout around 2013 when Tim and I purchased that nursery and it is a showstopper. I mean, this thing's probably three feet tall, five feet wide. And when it lights up in the spring, it is something to behold for sure. It's got so much pink in it. Now I will tell people with any of the variegated lace leaves that are the swirling style variegation. So the striping, not reticulated, but the truly like variegated, like Hanamatoe style variegation, you do want to prune those for variegation. So if you see any all red branches, you do want to remove those. They won't revert. They won't uh, go back to being variegated once they become all one color. Now, any all light colored branches, leave that. That's your most variegated stuff. Leave that going on, but trim out any, the dark color. I think a lot of people say, Hey, well, why, why would you do that? And it really gives the best color with Hanumatoe. And then if you're a grafters like us, you only want to graft from the best wood. Right. And so the best thing you can do is Japanese maples only have two growth periods during the season. We've got typically sometimes three, if you're in super hot zones, but you get one in the spring and typically one in the summer. And so if you watch it during the spring and the summer and you really look at the variegated branches and remove the ones that aren't, then you're really going to have the best variegated tree. Yeah, really nice even in the winter, or excuse me, in the fall, in the fall color. The fall color can be a very bright picked up red on the dark red and then kind of a still of a brighter pink color on the secondary color. So not only is it variegated you know, in its spring color, it looks pretty cool variegated in its fall color as well. Uh Always a classic, always sells out quickly, one that's highly sought after. Uh, you know, I would actually say an interesting side note to this one is that the reversion of Hanamatoe is very highly sought after as well. Yeah, the reversion on this is called uh, Prince Charming, and it really has unique colors. I mean, the colors stand out from any of the other Japanese maples. I know plenty of nurserymen, us included, that produce it just for that color that it reaches because it's a showstopper. It's got some funky stuff going on. You don't have as much of the light pink, but you get kind of a weird bronzing. And so even if you have a reverted form of this, it's, it's still highly sought after. I know plenty of people that produce it every single year for that reason. Yeah. And uh, it, Hanamatoe, it, it's an amazing plant. I think uh, in the book maples of Japan by Masayoshi Yano, he says this is one of the most spectacular Japanese variegated Japanese maples to, to exist. Yeah. And that's high praise coming from somebody who... Yano-san. Yano-san, who is a Japanese maple expert and the foremost Japanese maple expert from Japan. All right, guys. We're into our top three. So competition's getting hard here. Number three. This might even be a controversial one. I don't know. This might be... This will be <laughs> most people's number one. Uh, it's one of the most common Japanese maples, one of the most classic, one of the most sought after, one of the best selling. We've got Acer Palmatum Dissectum Tamukiyama. I love me some turkey mama. Yeah, we were at, we were at Nashville at the Nashville Lawn and Garden Show, and uh, we, sometimes our southern accents get a little thicker than other times. And this lady walked by, and Tim was selling a tamukiyama, and she said, Did that boy say turkey mama? And so we sometimes refer to this one as turkey mama. It's actually a tree from the Tamuki region in Japan, and you'll see yama on a lot of trees. Yama typically means mountain. It, it, it isn't a lot of lace leaves, too, because they look like mountains already. They make these small domes. It already looks like a mountain. Uh, Tamuki actually means hands folded in prayer, and then Yama meaning mountains. So you can take that one as hands folded in prayer on a mountain, which is a beautiful way to look at this one. One of the reasons we love Tamuki Yama, it's heat tolerant as all get out. It makes a great lace leaf for the south. It's common. 
It's popular. You'll see this one a lot in garden centers all around the world, but definitely in the deep south because it's durable, it handles the heat, and it holds the color great late into the season. Now with that hands folded in prayer on a mountain, I mean, I've always recommended this for people who are on mountaintops because of those late freezes because this leafs out two weeks later. Right. And that's one of the great things about Tamukiyama. If you have those late frosts like we do here in western North Carolina, we will often have a warm spring. Plants will start leafing out. But, you know, Mother Nature says, hey, wait, there's still another cold snap. There's a there's a late freeze coming. It's often two weeks later to leaf than many of the other Japanese maples. Mm -hmm. So not only is it extremely heat tolerant, like Matt mentioned, but it also is great because it leaves out two weeks later, avoiding threats of late frost. So if it's up there on the mountain, you won't have to be praying over your Japanese maples. <laughs> if it's going to have, it's going to be just buds often when those late frosts come through. Yeah. I love that. It's also not only one of the most cold tolerant for that reason, it's one of the most heat tolerant at holding its color in high heat zones. This one was named by Kobayashi Momiji Inn, the same nursery that named Ryusen. Uh, they're a 300 year old plus nursery in Japan. We got to go there and meet several of the family members. And it's pretty cool to go to a nursery that named Tamukiyama. I mean, that's, that's about as classic as you get. Uh, it was on the 1700s list. It's slightly after, but it's still a Japanese maple. It's been around for a long time. It stood the test of time. And it's still one of the best lace leaves in the game. I mean, it's still one of the very best ones out there. Um, it's durable. It's iconic. I like it because you can see into it a little bit. Tamukiyama tends to be a little bit more open, especially at a younger age. Some of the older ones start to have a little bit more cascading so you don't see into them as much. But typically on a younger plant, it's easy to prune and open this one up so you can see into the structure because it's a little bit more open than something like an Abba Shidari. Um, but durables all get out. You can put this one in your heavy zone uh, eight exposures and, you know, a lot of high heat zones. And it's just going to look great every year. I mean, I know it's Tom Cox's favorite Japanese maple because it looks good in August. Yeah, it's an awesome plant. And one of the things you mentioned about that open habit makes it perfect for that floating cloud kind of pruning style when it comes to lace leaf Japanese maples. And what I'm talking about is people often prune a Japanese maple to have an open appearance so you can see different layers that look almost like clouds on a lace leaf Japanese maple. And something like a Nabshadari would be more difficult to do because, like you mentioned, it's very dense in its habit, where the Tamukiyama is a little more open. And that really means that Tamukiyama is an excellent tree if you're wanting to shape your Japanese maples and do something unique with, because of that more open habit, you can look in and see some of that structure a little bit more. Tamukiyama, excellent, excellent Japanese maple. I mean, it doesn't have the easiest name for people to say, but because it is such a great plant, that's the reason why... It's so popular today. All right, we're up to number two. Number two on our lace leaves list is Acer palmatum dissectum orangiola. Yeah, I mean, this is an amazing Japanese maple. It's become quickly becoming the number one asked for Japanese maple when people are calling. Um, and maybe that just because it's Jody's one of her favorites. Right. She often pushes orangiola. Well, that's one of my favorites too. Yeah, it it's an amazing plant that goes through so many different shades of red that this tree is super spectacular. Yeah, they say Dr. Pepper has 32 flavors. Well, Orangeola has more than 32 colors in the early spring. It's every color. Like when you look at this one in the spring garden, it is almost a maroon in the early spring, but it's got bronzes, it's got reds, it's got orange. It's got so many things going on. It is really unique in that it has a different shape than most of the other lace leaves on this list as well. Now, where most of your lace leaves, like say an Abishadari or waterfall that we described, are going to be more dome-shaped. They're going to be more umbrella-shaped. The orangeola is going to be more bell-shaped. So this one uh, weeps strongly downward. So you can stake this one up, and it's a little bit more like Ryusin in its shape. I mean, it weeps distinctly downward, uh, typically making a 5x5. Five five. It's typically as wide as it is tall, where a lot of the trees on this, this list are a little bit wider than they are tall. It is distinctly one of the most pendulous Japanese maples. And for that reason, it's a great container plant. It's a great hanging basket plant. You can make some really cool shapes with it. I like to stake it up to a point and then just let it weep down from there because you're going to get that cascading effect from the uppermost part no matter what. Yeah, I love Orangeola. Extremely cascading. Great one for hanging baskets, obviously. But it is that ever-changing beauty. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's that tree that just cascades, has that amazing, amazing color, and just continues to rock it out with ever-changing color from the maroons fading to the 
light reds to emerald greens on the older growth. I mean, you get so many colors of red. This tree is spectacular. Now, my favorite time of the year for orangeola is actually midsummer, which is the oddest thing for a Japanese maple. We think of Japanese maples, we think of spring color, we think of fall color. Nobody picks a Japanese maple in like June, July as their favorite time of the year to look at one. And they just don't. I mean, that's normally when they're not at their most peak color. Orangey for, orangeola for me is at its peak color later in the season. You, you started to get greener, older growth. You have some electric uh, red new growth with then pink overlays over top of that. And I think that contrast of that late summer secondary flushes are so interesting. I think they make this one so cool. And they're what I like most about Acer Palmatum Orangeola. So coming at number one, Acer Palmatum Dissectum, Jermaine's Gyration. All right, guys. Uh, you know, we had Jay Sifford on a podcast. He did a, a magazine article for us one time. And I said this was the Mack truck of Japanese maples. And for good reason. Jermaine's Gyration, sometimes referred to as Contorta, same plant. Uh, is it's, it's named for Jermaine Isley, which is one of the people at Isley Nursery's mother, named by another nursery Four of them was actually a neighbor named this after Jermaine. Uh, awesome plant. It is vigorous as all get out. Now, if I was going to be an in-ground nursery operation, I'd probably grow a ton of Jermaine's gyration. People come to us, they say, I want a tree, uh, but, you know, I, I ain't got that long. <laughs> That's an answer we get a lot. Some of the funny things about people in Japanese maples are Japanese maples live to be well over 100 years old, so they make us think about our own mortality. So people say, how big does this get in 20 years? And you'll tell them, they go, I don't know if I got 20 years. <laughs> You're like, well, you can enjoy a maple at every stage, but if you want one that gets big quick, Jermaine's aeration is the plant for you. Jermaine's aeration is typically a 10 by 10 in a 10 year period, making it have that Longwood garden, that built more estate effect in a very small amount of time relative to its age. We recently saw one of these at Serapy Duke gardens and it was spectacular. Yeah. yeah. And it was easy to notice it because Jermaine's aeration has a little bit larger leaf. Mm -hmm. And when I started talking to uh, the curator, he mentioned how quickly this plant had grew. And it's easy to identify because of its characteristics. It also, its contorted habit is spectacular. I can't help but remember every time when I think of Jermaine's aeration, I just picture the one down in Spartanburg, South Carolina, right. at Bill and Kristen Taylor's. Yeah, shout out to Bill Taylor and Kristen Taylor. We're, we're definitely going to go do a walkthrough at their place at some point this spring. Uh, Kristen Starr is located in their garden introduction by Bill. He let us, uh, originally graph. We're the first people to graph that one. His Jermaine's gyration in that garden is one of the best trees I've ever seen. It is gorgeous. I know a nursery offered him a ridiculous amount of money to dig it up. And he said he would rather they drive through his house with the truck. <laughs> We're going to put it on a refrigerated truck, drive it very far away. He said, look, it's not for sale. It's a part of my house. I interact with this tree every single day when I walk in. And, uh, you know, aesthetically, he's a very good pruner, but it's not a tree you have to prune a lot. It makes a very cool open shape, even on its own. It's a tree that is known for being extremely contorted. I tell people a lot this too. We were on an episode of Growing a Greener World with Joe Gardner, and we shot an, uh, beside the Jermaine's Gyration of my parents' garden. And before we did some reshoots, we did some stuff with them later. The tree had grown, so it looked bigger in the second shot. So we went back to reshoot some stuff there, and the tree itself was significantly bigger than just a year before, and not even a year before. I mean, by the time the episode aired, it was massively different than the tree we had in the episode one year later. Uh, so it's a tree that gets out there. If you're looking for something that's going to have that impact of that it factor, it's got it. But you definitely need to give this one some room. And it has some really good fall colors, really, really good, some nice yellows to bold oranges on this plant. Mm -hmm. Excellent tree all around. One of my favorite Japanese maples. When it comes to top 25 lace leaves, Jermaine's Gyration had to be number one. Yeah, I, I love it, guys. It's got a large leaf. It's a green that, that goes to oranges and reds uh, in the fall, and it is just spectacular. I've had it be bright yellow with bold orange underlays. It just changes a lot. It's amazing plant. It's durable as all get out. You can put this one in full sun up to zone eight, typically on the East Coast. Uh, you know, it depends on your heat index. Watch some of those heaters, hotter zones. But it is as durable of a tree as we grow and as fast growing of a lace leaf as you'll find. And it's distinctly weeping. So unlike that Seru that's going to be an upright tree, this one maintains that, that umbrella shape, but with all the vigor you could ever imagine. 
Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed our top 25 lace leaf Japanese maples. These were all Acer Palmatum Dissectum. We tried to put in a lot of unique, different lace leaves in this, make sure that we weren't repeating a lot of the same characteristics. Mm -hmm. And I think this top 25 was pretty amazing. If you're listening, we really appreciate you. If you're watching this on YouTube, how do you think we did for our top 25 Japanese maples? Guys, we hope we've earned a, a sub from you. Uh, we give out basically a free book every week on Japanese maple content. And if that's something you like and you think we did a good job, definitely subscribe and definitely find us on your favorite podcast platform and give us a five-star rating. That goes a long way toward getting our content out there. We're a small gardening channel, but we love to talk about Japanese maples and we do it every single day. So we really appreciate you tuning in for that. And, and definitely, if you, there's some plants on this list that you are interested in, I, think about supporting us by checking out with MrMaple.com. If these aren't in stock right now, you can always sign up to get notified via email when they're back in stock. We bring 10 new trees every single Tuesday at 10 a.m., but that's really not true. We actually list 20, and so you can sign up to get notified of that whole 20 trees. A lot of these trees will be listing this year in 2023 when we put this list out, and so you want to be part of that. Check our websites at Tuesday at 10 a.m. Eastern for new and exciting plants. Take care. God bless. And have a great day.